Uh, it's great to be back here. I was in the Texas LP convention. It was in Austin. That's all I remember. The years fade away, but I remember it was, it was very pleasant. And uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, I guess I'm slated for a current affairs topic, and uh, a lot of fantastic things happening in the world. Well, you wouldn't know it from the, uh, from the National Party. I'll get back to that a little later. Uh, what's happening in the world is that there's uh, literally the... We're really living through a, what the historians call a revolutionary moment in history. Uh, it's like something like living through the French Revolution. <clears throat> and um, uh, fortunately, we're living at it for a fairly safe spot. <laughs> but we can kind of watch it on TV, which is my favorite way of watching a revolution. <laughs> uh, but what we're seeing is the, literally the collapse uh, of the, the big movement of the 20th century, namely socialism. <clears throat> we're seeing the death of socialism. The throws, and um, the um, the uh, socialism was the big movement of the 20th century, the big ideological and political movement. <clears throat> and uh, what we're seeing at the end of the 20th century is one of the very exciting time in which to live because we're seeing the, the collapse of socialism, the revolutionary implosion, of socialism. <clears throat> uh, the um, what, we, what was what, what happened was that over the last several centuries, starting in the 17th and going up to the 18th and 19th century, we had a, a march, an upward march, not, not of course every day, but basically an upward march uh, of, of freedom <clears throat> and uh, the death of the old order, which was statism and serfdom and slavery and uh, theocracy. <clears throat> and uh, rising up from this, from this muck, was, was the idea of individual freedom and the institutions of individual freedom, personal freedom, religious freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, free markets. And with that came uh, international peace, replacing uh, war, constant dynastic wars and, and uh, territorial conquests, <clears throat> and the rise for the first time in history of mass consumption. In other words, standards of living, not only increasing standards of living, but standards of living that were actually rising from uh, subsistence level, uh, where the general public could buy stuff. This is you know, unusual, unique in world history. In the old days, you didn't buy stuff. You didn't go to the store and buy stuff. It was the, the housewife... You bought cloth if you had the money, and the housewife would sew the clothing and stuff. <clears throat> and that was the, the idea of mass production for the for a consumer market as, a, as an industrial revolution concept of the product of the free markets of the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. <clears throat> so what you had is, I mean, just saying the growth of the standard of living doesn't, doesn't really encompass that. It's a, the beginning of a real living standard. <clears throat> and uh, with this, you have a tremendous progress in all areas, in civilization and, and economics and, and personal liberty and technology, which goes along with it. <clears throat> and, um, and so the 19th century was the, was the breaking through of this century, several century old movement of what we call classical liberalism. Of course, those days, they didn't, they didn't call it classical. Uh, <laughs> we call it classical because it sort of died out and we're trying to uh, essentially restore it. And, uh, and this, this liberal movement was, was rising and everything was going great and the liberals at the time were very optimistic, as they was well they should be. And then something happened. A glitch happened. Something happened on the way to, uh, to uh, Nirvana, uh, <laughs> and the something that happened was the growth of for the development of socialism, which was a brand, brand new idea in human history. <clears throat> and uh, the socialist idea, which really sprouts in the 1830s and 1840s in, in Europe, uh, was that we can still have this because the, the the previous opposition to classical liberalism, the, the opposition to freedom, was an opposition in defense of the old order. It was specifically anti-industrial anti-mass consumption movement, the idea of keeping the lords and the dukes and the earls in their places in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the state churches, and keeping their power and position. It was, a, it was specifically and frankly an anti-general freedom movement, and anti-industrial movement. Well, the socialists came along and said, look, we can do both things. We can have, we can have the same thing. Too. We can have uh, higher standards of living. As a matter of fact, we'll have better than, ca- than liberalism or capitalism does it. We can have a High on advancing standard of living, we can have freedom, and we can have everybody be happy, and so forth and so on. We can do it through state control. You have better, a better, uh, better ways through statism, and we can have, in fact, we'll have more state control than before. We'll have the people's state instead of having a class state of a few people running it, a few dukes and uh, kings, etc. We can have the whole people collectively running the people. Okay. So, uh, so this concept of collectivism is a brand new thing, and it sounded great and was generally. Uh, supported by uh, many folk whose 
either yearn for the old order or try to blend the, the two liberalism and anti-liberalism to one higher, allegedly higher synthesis. And so by the end of the 19th century, if you go read some of the classical liberals, it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing because the classical liberals of the late 19th century, around 1900, saw the whole thing as cracking. The socialism was on the march, and the general public was backing it. If the general public previously had backed libertarianism or classical liberalism. We, we were a mass movement in the 19th century. In England and much of the continent and the United States, we had the votes. We, were a libertarian, we had libertarian parties, so to speak, not the name of the actual content. <clears throat> but by the late, by 1890s or 1900, every, the, the days of night were closing in, the shades were, were closing in, uh, and, uh, and Herbert Spencer and all, uh, other classical liberals writing at the time were very pessimistic. I got the whole thing is shot. Civilization has had it. And as such, they were right. They saw the they forecast, foresaw the, the uh, terror of the 20th century, the, the gulag, etc., of the 20th century. <clears throat> anyway, by, the, by 1900 or so, the general opinion, uh, uh, so-called intelligent opinion, was socialism is morally correct. Uh, that's right. It's morally correct that social justice will be imposed, etc., etc., through this new collectivism. And the only problem was, will it work? They weren't, people weren't sure it would work. because It's so radical and new. But the thing is, socialists have captured the conquer of the high moral ground. Everybody agreed that they're morally, morally correct, but just a certain practicality hadn't cleared up yet. <laughs> well, if, you have, if you're in a situation where everybody says, in general opinion, and, and intellectuals, etc., say that the socialists are right, or they're morally correct, it's just we're not sure it will work, the next step, inevitable next step, is, okay, let's, let's let them try it. Let's see if it'll work or not. And that's, the, that's what happened in the 20th century. It sums up the 20th century, starting, of course, with the Bolshevik Revolution. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, well, let it work. I, I, was, I grew, up, grew up in the 1930s, and in the 1930s, the general view was, well, of course, there's certain excesses in Russia. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> few, people, uh, few people got their head chopped off, but that's, let's see, that's a noble experiment. We, let's see if the socialist, socialist experiment works. We'll, we'll, have to, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Let's see if, the, you know... The famous phrase in those days was, in order to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Uh, and of course, the people who wear the eggs didn't like it too much. <laughs> uh, but who cares if you have a wonderful collective omelet, which we can all eat. <laughs> okay. um, well, anyway, we now have the record. Okay? I mean, after the 20th century, is essentially, as I say, a process of socialism working itself out. And, uh, by the way, I see no difference, really, between socialism and communism. I feel it's the same thing. Uh, by the way, this was the, the view of the, 18, the original socialists of the 1830s and 40s. To them, socialism and communism are interchangeable terms. And um, uh, it's only later in the 20th century when the fruits of socialism began to be pretty bitter. People didn't like the fact, hey, we got slave labor here and, and, and mass murder. And then socialists in the United States would say, well, if that's not our socialism. We didn't, we didn't plan on that. Uh, we want democratic socialism with freedom and free speech and all that. Just we want collective ownership of means of production. <clears throat> so the idea of so-called democratic socialism was a cop-out uh, where socialists refused to accept the consequences of their own their own policy and action. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in World War II, when F.A. Hayek wrote the, wrote the Road to Serfdom, uh, this is a big thing. If you read it now, it seems well, kind of plonky. It seems to be sort of... Uh, Everybody agrees on this, but they didn't agree on it at the time. When he wrote the Road to Serfs in 1943-44, this is a revolutionary statement, because what he said was, there ain't no such thing as democratic socialism. If you have government ownership and planning of means of production, if you, plan, if you have government planning of the economy, it means everybody's life is being planned. You can't have free speech, you can't have democracy, you can't have freedom of the press, freedom of assembly or expression, if you have government ownership and control of means of production. It's essentially what he said in those days was bitterly opposed by most right-thinking, upstanding right-thinking people. Um, and uh, it now turns out, and I'm going to show evidence of this as going along, this is, this is now agreed upon by almost everybody. Almost everybody. Certainly in the communist countries agree, it, agree on it. Uh, that, you, that, that, that economic freedom and free markets go hand-in-hand <laughs> hand with personal freedom and freedom of the press and, and freedom of expression. Uh, the, uh, well, what happens is that the, uh, with the record of socialism piling up <coughs> uh, after World War II becomes pretty obvious. You have slave labor camps, gulags, concentration camps, mass murder, genocide, etc., etc., begin to have a kind of a weakening of the position here. The, the legitimacy, uh, the high moral ground begins to crumble a little bit. Okay. Uh, and um, the... Um, 
and, 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 and public opinion and the general intellectual receptor begin to realize there's something morally bad about socialism. Doesn't seem to doesn't seem to really give the high moral uh, ground here. Uh, and the and also what happens, I think, it's also important to, to to realize here that the what happens over history, we think of it. And at the time, we think of every day-to-day things are not happening. No changes are taking place. You look at the still the same jerks in power, Democrats, Republicans. It looks as if nothing's really happening. There's no change. It's sort of a frozen system. Well, it's it become it continues quote frozen unquote for a long time as small tensions develop, disagreements, conflicts, and suddenly this is what happened. What's happening now in the communist countries? Suddenly, bingo, like that. Suddenly, suddenly eruption. It's like the French Revolution. Nothing much was happening in France for about 80 years. More and more statism, people grumbling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And suddenly, there's some trigger, and the and the and the there's an eruption of all the pent up tensions and and, and uh, conflicts that have, that have been piling up. So, now what happened in, in, in what happened in the communist countries is the original revolutionary generation uh, began to die out. If you're committing your whole life to a cause, you're up on the guerrilla guerrilla warfare on the hills or whatever you are. And you take, you seize power in a country, as in Russia or in Cuba or whatever, uh, or in China. You know, you're, the original revolutionary generation is committed to it. They murder all the people who are not committed to it. For one thing, all the, <laughs> the people, with the dissidents, and the guys who are beginning to question get, get sent to the slave labor camp or get, or get killed. Uh, and so uh, these guys continue to be committed to the cause until they die out. And uh, I'm not in favor of death, you understand, but there's a certain, there's a certain Sociologically, the older generation, the people, the, the revolutionary leadership die out. The younger people coming up are not that committed. They're sort of born into the system. It's a big difference between fighting on the hills and marching down and taking over and seizing power. It's a very heady thing to seize power. <laughs> uh, you can put up with a lot of, a lot of heartache and, and, and starvation, etc., cetera, et cetera, especially if you're in the ruling elite. You don't get to starve anyway. You're in pretty good shape, and so uh, being in the ruling elite and having founded the the uh, new revolutionary society, you're going to be committed to it for life in general. Uh, but the new people coming up, as the next generation succeeds, generation they're not committed to it; they're just born in it. And the, and the fascinating thing is that you know the totalitarian. One of the lessons of the current situation is that totalitarianism doesn't work. It just doesn't work because these people were brought up in Russia and China and etc. etc. Were brought up from the, the year zero to accept. To listen to all this crap, get it from the beaming from the, from the government-run educational system, down to the local block level. You owe your life to the society. You're, you're the slave of the state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, it doesn't take. The great thing is it doesn't take. And freedom is, a na- is obviously a natural condition of mankind. It just erupts. You can't crush the spirit of freedom. It's just magnificent. Uh, so the 1984, the Orwell, the Orwell uh, doom and gloom message, which was a great book, but it's just it's not true. But it doesn't work. You can't suppress the, uh, the spirit of freedom. That's what we're finding out. I remember when, uh, when, I, when the Chinese communists first took over uh, in the 1950s or so. There's a, uh, I think the Yugoslavs uh, had a very interesting movie about China, communist China. <clears throat> I, I saw the movie. It was very interesting because uh, the interviewer was talking to, the, to an allegedly average Chinese communist family, and they said they asked the mother and father, "What would you like your kid to be when he grows up?" And they said, well, all we want for the kids is to be the a, a, a obedient subject of the government, the state, the people's state. It was a pretty chilling thing to watch. And uh, I said to myself, geez, is it really true? And they really, I really brainwashed this whole nation. You know, is it really truly that mankind has been transformed? The so-called new socialist man has been created, which is just a willing robots uh, to the state apparatus. And uh, I asked a friend of mine at the time, who had just been released, uh, he, was, he, was, he was in the State Department, <clears throat> In China, he was interned during the Korean War, and uh, so he was a China expert. And I asked him, well, "Is this really true? Is it true that the Chinese have been totally brainwashed? We're going to have a new, a new socialist man, new communist man emerging?" And he said, "No, don't worry about it, because in China is an old tradition. When the central government official comes to town, you tell him what he wants to hear, and when he leaves town, you go about your business again." And so it, it turned out, <laughs> and uh, it's a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing the way people can adapt and yet keep their uh, much of their personal integrity. And so. Of course, it turns out, turns, about, turns out to be true. <clears throat> so the new generation coming up, uh, they hear about Marxism, Leninism, well, I don't, they, they don't believe this crap anymore. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, Earl Ravenel, who's a libertarian foreign policy expert, went to Russia for the first time in many years, visited Moscow. This is way before any kind of 
glasnost or perestroika. <clears throat> and he came back and I spoke to him. He said, you know, it's a fantastic thing. Nobody in Russia believes in Marxism anymore. Nobody. He spoke to all sorts of people, big shots, little shots, whatever. <laughs> Nobody believes this junk anymore. But so what, what began to happen is as the generations continue, had a bunch of people in power who were sort of operating by inertia. They wanted to keep their power, obviously. There was no more legitimacy on the part of the, They had no more legitimacy. No more Marxism-Leninism Marxism, purely lip service. And once you lose, you, use, you lose your legitimacy, you lose your moral um, legitimacy, so to speak, the rest, the, the, the collapse of the system becomes inevitable, especially if the system doesn't work, is my next point. I mean, there was the moral legitimacy of, of socialism is finished. It's certainly finished in the communist countries. It's not finished, unfortunately, in the West. The only Marxists left are in American universities. <laughs> Western, <laughs> Western European universities. Uh, it began to be a, a, a joke. So it's not much of a joke, it's sort of a political joke, but it's a pretty good, nevertheless. And among economists, this was by the 1950s and 60s, uh, when most economists were, in the West were still Keynesians and semi-socialists, and, uh, uh, and the joke was, that inter at international economic conferences, the, the, co the economists from the communist countries were talking about the virtues of the free market, and the, and the economists from the West were talking about the virtues of government planning. <laughs> okay? Well, uh, th so that's, that's, this keeps, keeps going on. It's kept escalating. <clears throat> and, um, and what you have is, is, is uh, in the communist countries, where it's obvious, first they lose the moral legitimacy and the re revolutionary enthusiasm, and then they see the goddamn thing doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You don't get mass prosperity. You have mass starvation. And a grinding, crummy system that keeps you know, on. And if you get any consumer goods at all, it's all gray and miserable, crummy. Okay? <laughs> And they don't want to live in a crummy world. Okay? And they see that they, they, the interchange with the West, they see that other people are in, are in pretty good shape. Uh, and why can't we have the same sort of thing? And, this, and, this, and, the, and they want, they're committed, in the communist countries, they're committed to the industrial revolution, they're committed to a modern industrial economy. They realize they can't get it with, uh, under socialism, they just can't get it. It's become, it's become painfully obvious as, as time has gone on. Uh, and so what, uh, what's happened is that there's a collapse of legitimacy and followed now by a collapse of, of obviously, the economy and, and, a, and, a, and a reaching out to try to get, get rid of this. How do we get rid of this damn status system? Essentially, the, the questions and now they're, they're coursing through Eastern Europe and, uh, and the communist countries in general. Um, there's a charming, there's like a marvelous little story in Los Angeles. Every day something new happens. I was just reading a review of a book, I guess, uh, by Walter LeCur. I guess it was in the New York Review of Books. It was, uh, it was this... He's an expert on, account, account, on Russia. And the guy, the reviewer, said, well, it's an interesting book, but it was written, just came out. It was written in late 1988, and it's all obsolete now. So much has happened. All, all the stuff the guy says is now rendered uh, untrue by events. Okay, so, the, cause, I mean, what, what happens in a revolutionary period is fantastically radical change. I mean, Deng Xiaoping used to be a, a liberal reformer. I mean, he started the movement toward the free market in China about 10 years ago. He's now a reactionary pig repressing the people, he has the same views that he had before, just the events have, 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 have outpaced him. It's very much like the French Revolution. And uh, just hasn't caught, hasn't caught up with the idea, you have to have, if you want to have a free market and modern industry, you have to have, you have, to have free expression of, and free speech, free press. He doesn't, hasn't realized that yet, of course he's cracking down, he's also an old guardsman. Another, I mean, he, he was one of the long march people. One thing about China, by the way, is that, uh, as, as everybody knows, I think we should emphasize this, uh, the leadership is all, all in the upper 80s, or early 90s. I mean, the, the, the youngsters, the young liberals, are in the, about 75. <laughs> I mean, if this were the only thing that attracts me about communist China is that if I were if I were in communist China, I'd be a, 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 a brilliant teenage youth leader. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so these guys are going to disappear pretty soon, and the, and the people are not committed the revolutionary generation didn't march from Yan'an or whatever in 1937. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be very different. I think the forces of freedom are going to win out. So, um, so there's a lot of, I said, well, what, so one fascinating article in the Los Angeles Times a few months ago was this. A guy who was in, in Moscow, was born in Russia, been an American citizen for many years, has set up for the first time in Russia a copy center. We all know about copy centers. They're all over the place. This is a, a revolutionary thing. Can't have, how can you have a copy center in a country which tries to be totalitarian, which tries to keep people from, from learning anything? You can't do it. Once you allow copy machines, that's the end of totalitarianism. Okay? And, but they, want, they, don't want to, they want to prohibit copy machines. They want, to, they want a modern world. They want high tech. How can you have high tech without copy machines, without personal computers? 
How can you have a personal computer still have a totalitarianism, hermetically sealed country? You can't do it. So the very the force of modern technology, the force of industrial revolution, requires free, a free market, and uh, it's becoming obvious to the, to the even the leadership, much less the public, uh, in the communist countries. And he said this is the beginning. He hopes to have a whole chain of copy centers. Okay, and this, this is just tip of the iceberg. There are only, the, the only countries now. There are two countries I think. I mean, I could be corrected on this. There are two countries in the world which still prohibit typewriters among the public. <laughs> Uh, in order to have a typewriter, you have to have a government license, you have to be carefully investigated and all that. <laughs> One is Albania, which is sort of, uh, Albania, what can I say about Albania? It's the place that nobody wants to go, even Albanians. <laughs> okay. No tourists go to Albania for an excellent reason. And, uh, and Iraq, where uh, the heroic free world leader, Saddam Hussein, <laughs> uh, monster, who, uh, you know, can, <laughs> every peasant's hut has a picture of Hussein on, it, on his wall, otherwise he's shot. Uh, outside of that, uh, all countries permit typewriters, and they're going to permit copy centers, they're going to permit personal computers, and all the rest of it. Otherwise, they ain't nowhere. So, uh, what we have, what we see then, is the whole, let's say, breaking up of the whole communist, the, the communist totalitarian center. The, all the books we've read, we've grown up on, uh, you, you, the whole the picturing communism as a Russian monolith, but a very efficient monolith, of course, by the way, satanic. The usual right-wing picture, the Cold War picture of, of Russia, or communism, is of a satanic, brilliantly efficient, monolithic movement uh, organized by the Kremlin, which is going to take over unless we nuke them, nuke them right away. Uh, and this whole, thing is, this whole thing is now obsolete, if it were true at all, which I don't think it was, it's certainly now obsolete. You can't keep saying that anymore. The whole thing is now like reading about some 17th century cult, because the whole thing is now cracking up. Uh, they're even attacking Lenin now in Russia. They're even attacking Marx some of the radicals. Maybe the whole thing starts with Marx. We have to investigate this whole business. Uh, they're publishing Solzhenitsyn. They're doing almost anything you can say. I mean, Yeltsin is getting... I mean, to think that a nationwide Soviet television, a guy gets up in the Soviet Congress and bitterly attacks the KGB, I mean, this Olympic wrestler, and attacks it bitterly. Man, anything we could have said, he, he did the same thing. And the head of the KGB gets up and says, well, you're right, but that wasn't my regime. I'm just, I just came in there. I'm going to reform it now. <laughs> I mean, he's speaking like an American politician, for Christ's sake. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a great collection. By the way, in Russia and in Poland now, of course, they have, in one sense, they're more democratic than we are because if they, they have these guys running unopposed for elections. This happened in, in Russia a few months ago and happened in Poland just the other day. They're running unopposed. And they cross their name out and they don't get elected. They don't get a majority of the votes of those voting. They get, they get defeated. In other, in other words, none of the above now operates only in Russia and in Poland, not, not in the United States. <laughs> in Nevada, my, my state of Nevada, there's none of the above, but it's only symbolic. It doesn't mean a damn thing. In other words, if none of the above gets a majority, a guy still gets in. It's considered just a, in Russia and Poland, it's now effective. Okay? And they did it. They really just crossed their names out. So uh, there's a marvelous cartoon after the Russian election where these top communists, unopposed communists in Moscow and Leningrad were defeated. And there's a great cartoon that's sitting around on a panel facing the audience, three Russian, defeated Russian communist politicians. They said, one guy says, what are we going to do now? The other guy says, don't worry, we'll become lobbyists and consultants. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, adopting the American, good old American practice. <laughs> so so I, I'd say these are fantastic things. I, my own uh, personal experience uh, Goes, goes along with this. I wasn't. I was not in any of these cu countries at the recent Glasnost period, but uh, I was twice in Hungary and twice in Poland. It's kind of interesting. The, the, the first time um, I was in Hungary, this is something yeah, quite a few years ago. And you go in, you know, in communist countries, the tour guy, you go on a bus tour of Budapest or Warsaw or whatever, and the bus guys were all trained operatives, communist party apparatchiks. <laughs> and they're not sort of dumb dumbs like having the United States, and they know the name of the square. Okay? They're highly trained, intelligent apparatchiks. So this, this bus this tour guy was giving us this. You go to the main square in Budapest, where Attila the Hun, the statues of the great heroes of Hungary, like Attila the Hun, I kid you not. Uh, <laughs> I have to have Attila the Hun revisionism <laughs> here. Anyway, you go to the square, you see these guys hanging around up, up to no visible good in the square, and the, and the, and the bus guy says, don't. Don't talk to these evil men because they send you counterfeit currency. You know, what they're really doing, of course, is selling you black market forints, Hungarian currency, at a much better rate you can get in government rate. The interesting thing is they were there. I mean, the government had not stamped them out. They were, there was an open, visible black market. And the tour guide was just saying, Don't, these, these, are, these are bad men, they'll send you counterfeits. Uh, the next time I was in Hungary, that was last year, four or five years after that, 
The tour guide was, from the beginning we sat down on the bus until the end, the guy was attacking the government. The entire time. <laughs> the crooks and tyrants, the communists and so good. I mean, the whole time, it just cut the stream. It was just magnificent. And, uh, and in Hungary, the, the whole thing, the whole thing, is, nobody, they're, they're sitting around discussing about the, there's a multi-party system coming up. Most of the parties refuse to even put socialism on their on the platform. No, no, we're against socialism. And they, they're negotiating the government. The government said, can we put in socialism, freedom within socialism? No, toss it out. No, no socialism. And Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian communists are now in favor of private property rights, free markets. I mean, the whole bit, extremely limited government. The whole thing, is, I mean, everything is totally collapsing. It's just great. Um, in, um, in Poland, I was, I was in Poland twice. The, uh, the first time, this was a conference organized by English conservatives, English conservative, semi-libertarian conservatives, I guess you'd call them. And uh, in Poland, this is about three, four years, I guess, four years ago. And uh, uh, it was a conference, it was very intellectually very free. The guy, the tour guy, was obvious Communist Party spy. No question, everybody knew it. Okay. Uh, and at the conference, the guy was, I mean, tour guys usually don't sit in on, on pa scholarly papers, right? <laughs> he was sitting in every Communist, paying particular attention to the world of Poland. He didn't care about us. We were just, capitalist pigs, even that. I didn't care about Americans or British. The Poles are all out. They all denounced the government from the beginning of the conference to the end. All evil. And, and the Polish intellectuals, the spread of the spectrum was from dissident Marxists to, to Catholic traditionalists to libertarians. Okay? And, uh, and they were constantly, they were just denouncing the government from pillar to post. And um, they read my stuff, they read me, they read everybody in Poland. It was great. And uh, so um, uh, the next, next year after that, Second year, uh, same thing. Except I saw that this is the Marxists are gone. You, you're left with the traditionalists and the, and the libertarian. Where's, so I asked one of the guys, where are, they, where are the Marxists? And I said, we don't need them this year. <laughs> the, the previous year, they used them as a cover so the government could allow the conference. By the, by the next year, which is like two years ago, they didn't need the cover anymore. And the tour guy was not a Soviet agent. And the whole thing, was no, there were no agents anymore. The whole thing was obviously much freer than it was before. So uh, as a matter of fact, the end of the talking about the first year of Poland, where, the, where the, there was a Soviet agent there, I mean, a government agent there, uh, at the end of the final banquet, uh, the director of the conference, he said, I, I hereby raise a toast. I hope nobody misunderstands the meaning of this or something. My to the toast is to a free, sovereign, and Catholic Poland. Everybody toasted, including the Soviet, the, the, the government agent, the communist agent. Everybody <laughs> drank the toast of it. So at any rate, the whole, so the whole thing is uh, just, uh, just, just magnificent to see it. And... Um, and tremendous ferment. One of the things which I found very moving was, now I forget whether this is Poland or Hungary, one of these countries is, an American, is on television, it was a demonstration against the government a few months ago. And one of the, and one of the, per, one of the people in the crowd was being interviewed by, the, I guess, an American station or whatever. And, uh, and the guy said, please, people in the West, help us, help us, give us a role model or something, help us to destatize. Is basically what he said. How do we de-socialize? How do we get out of this stuff? Everybody wants to get rid of the government. We want sort of government control and the rest of it. And the interesting thing, the thing is which sort of ticks me off is we've had 40 years now of think tanks, right-wing foundations, scholarly research grants, and all the rest of it. Must be millions of dollars poured into this stuff, and nobody, not one of them, has said, "How do we? How does the, how does the communist government destatize?" Supposing you say, "Okay, we read Mises, we read, we read um, Friedman or whatever it is, we, and we come to the conclusion the whole thing doesn't work. How do we destatize? Blank out, nothing, right?" I mean, so much resources are going to the, how many nuclear through weights we should have. You know, nobody said, well, how do, how do they get rid of that goddamn thing? And not one piece of research has gone into them. I mean, Milton Friedman had an interesting article in Newsweek about 10 years ago that the way to, one of the ways to destatize this, give everybody a share in, the, in the, you know, TVA. You wake up in the morning, you got to, here's a share of TVA, which you, now, you can now negotiate. Well, that's one way to do it, but the thing is, no, very few people have thought about this. How do you do it? How do you take this whole rotten government-owned control system and... Destatize it. And one of the reasons for this, and one of the reasons why, that for the, from personally, for the big break between libertarians and conservatives many years ago, is the conservatives, the conservative view is this could never happen. You can never have destatization. The conservative doctrine is, and this is, the, I think, the fundamental error of conservatism in this whole thing, is that once a country becomes communist, that's it. It's like a black hole. If this if disappears from history and becomes part of a satanic monolith. <laughs> Well, now it turns out they're wrong. It's not, it's not a black hole. People have erupted. The whole thing is imploding, exploding, and whatever. And uh, so, and conservatives not yet adjusted to this 
this new, new situation. Some of them have. It's very interesting how you see conservatives on television. Some of them are saying, hey, there's no, cold, there's no more Cold War. There's no more. Yeah, what is this? The whole thing is falling apart. And, this, um, and that, that's another, I think, interesting aspect of all this. Um, is that, uh, is that an, an implication for American politics um, is, is that uh, if there's no more communist, communism is falling apart, there's no so-called communist threat, what's the point of a Cold War? Why do you have these, these 2,800 missiles, whatever the hell it is? Why do we have to spend umpteen trillion dollars on, on missile programs and, and military, comp, uh, military industrial complex? Why indeed? Uh, and so this, this, this creates a whole new political situation in the United States, which is bound to continue and, and, and get, and get uh, more intense. The whole, it's a whole change of, a whole change of, of uh, realignment, ideological realignment, everything else, coming from the fact that communism is disappearing and cracking up, and the Cold War threat is therefore over. And it will take quite a while, because there's a vested interest in it, for people to realize it. And uh, oddly enough, Zbigniew Brzezinski is one of the few people, I, mean, I have very little, very little use for Zbigniew, but one of the a few people has really sort of seen this. He's just written a book called I think called The Death of Communist. A few, but a few people realize this whole thing is over. I mean, this whole thing is a fundamental change in, 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 in current history. <clears throat> um, and uh, it was kind of amusing. The New York Times, which is not, does not often go in for humor, uh, those of you who are familiar with a good gray New York Times, and except for Russell Baker's column, there's almost nothing ever funny in this uh, very stately publication. <laughs> And they actually had a funny article. I mean, I think consciously funny. <laughs> I think. Uh, in New York Times about a year ago. And, they, and, they, uh, and this reporter was, invest- was de- uh, investigating or uh, dealing with the foreign, what's known as the foreign policy community. It's a lovely term. Uh, all the guys who live off government grants, consulting fees and all that, to study uh, <laughs> through weights and foreign geopolitics and foreign policy and all that. And they were worried about maybe the Cold War is over. What's going to happen to the foreign policy community? <laughs> there ain't no more war. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, and they have, they've had many conferences on this, as you can imagine, at the swanky hotels all over the world. They're trying to figure out, is this, is the, is the, are the good times over <laughs> for the foreign policy community? And they've come clued, nah, don't worry about it, because there's always something. There's always the Ayatollah, of course, he's now dead. There's always some threat somewhere which we can manufacture or help along or whatever, or highlight, <laughs> put it that way, and keep this whole damn thing going, keep, keep the whole military-industrial scam going. Um, so apparently they've, they've relaxed, at least to some extent. Uh, and uh, but it, it's uh, but it's phen- I mean the whole thing is just, it's, it's, the whole thing is phenomenal. And uh, I think even the Ayatollah, of course, has now died. I have to find somebody. It's always Colonel Gaddafi to, to dig out. Uh, of course, poor Colonel Noriega, for whom I have sort of a sneaking, a sneaking admiration because he seems to be holding fast, even despite all the entire weight of the United States uh, uh, hysteria. He's still there. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, the, um, it would be, be very difficult to continue this for one period of time, trying to get terrible satanic threats out of somebody like Noriega. This is somehow doesn't, that doesn't, uh, doesn't, that doesn't really work. Doesn't run up the flag on that. But the one thing, I mean, even, and even in China, before this uh, terrible situation, even in China, the fascinating thing happened. This is, this is shortly before the crisis broke out. Uh, there was two interesting things that happened in one week. It just so happened, it was a coincidental over one week. Uh, the Mises Institute, from which I'm, which I'm located and I have a, a vice president of, which is, of course, a straight laissez-faire uh, outfit, uh, got, a, got a message from the Chinese embassy in Washington. What they wanted was all the works of Ludwig von Mises. They wanted to find out, figure out how to desocialize. Okay? And I, I mean, who else is reading works of Ludwig von Mises? Certainly not the U- U.S. government. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, wanted to, they wanted to read Ludwig von Mises. They wanted to read my stuff. They wanted to read stuff, how to desocialize. Okay? They wanted to read about socialism. In the meantime, that same week, there's a little AP dispatch from China. The Chinese government is worried because over the last two or three years, 1,800 tax collectors have been beaten up and killed in China. <laughs> so masses are rising up, and the first thing they do is get the goddamn tax collector. <laughs> so, uh, and even, even with the, even the terrible situation in China, you have like the, 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 these, these poor guys on television, and of course, there's a fantastic, whole thing is a fantastic situation. And they, and they said, they keep saying to the reporters, don't worry, the, the people's army can't, sh- can't shoot the people. I mean, it seems like, it seemed to them like an elementary situation. How can the people's army shoot the people? Well, of course, it turned out the people's army did shoot the people. And what the lesson of all this is, of course, is there ain't no such thing as a people's army or a people's government, right? The, the, the people and the government are different. And I think they've learned, unfortunately, learned the lesson from the massacres. But I mean, the, the thing is that 
Um, all the myths of socialism and collectivism, economic myths, ideological myths, all the rest of us are falling apart and becoming evidently crazy and ridiculous. Evidently, the, the emperor's clothes are being stripped off the emperor. So, and what's happening, as I say, is the, rule, uh, the, the Marxists have always said, when they, our Marxists are great analysts of revolution. They're interested in the revolution. How do they work? How do they not work? How do they win? And all that. And the Marxists have said for a long time that no, no ruling class will ever voluntarily give up their power, okay, which is very true, except if the ruling class loses its will to, will to power. If something happens to the ruling elite. They begin to crack. And what happened in Russia in 1917 there weren't that many Bolsheviks around. How did they take over? It's a huge country. They had a big state apparatus, a big, a big secret police, and all the rest of it, which essentially the communists just took over and expanded. Um, how did they lose? And, and uh, well, they lost because, for one thing, the ruling elite lost its will of power. They didn't know what the hell to do. They, were, they had a big war on their hands, which they were losing. They were losing the war. There were people, there were soldiers who were leaving the front, shooting their officers, and walking home all over Russia. This is World War I. And... Uh, and the, and, the, and the Russian government and all the Russian political parties except the Bolsheviks were committed to continuing the war forever. Totally an insane commitment. We have to know, we have to fight German imperialism. And that's it. And so with this situation, with this commitment to the continuing, they didn't know what the heck to do. They were losing the war. They didn't know how the, the legitimacy was being questioned. They essentially quit. Essentially, m big sections of the ruling elite hived off. And... Uh, and the same thing is happening in the communist system right now. So the communist leadership doesn't know what to do. They said this whole thing is hopeless, and we quit. The interesting thing is there's some very interesting articles, which I recommend on this whole thing. Timothy Garton Ash, who's an English free market person, writes for The Spectator in England, also writes for the New York Review of Books on Hungary and Poland. Those are his two areas of expertise. There were a very interesting article about two, or three, about two weeks ago, I think the last issue. And he just came back from Hungary and Poland. Even he was excited by him because he's on top of the situation. He was, he was amazed at what's happening. And one of the things is the ruling elite in Hungary, for example, realized the whole thing is shot. Statism doesn't work. They want to get out of this. They want, to, they want to surrender. They want to get out of it, however, without getting their throats cut and also maintaining some economic privileges. And they want to become capitalists. They want to smooth the transition between socialism and capitalism and keep, keep some of their perks. That's essentially what they want to do, the nomenclatura, okay? They're trying to find that these negotiations that are going on in Poland and Hungary, essentially negotiations how to do that, how to let these guys off the hook, uh, get them out of power, and they'll find a way to do it. I mean, there's no precedent for this. Is one of the, I think a Hungary, Hungarian official said, look, there's, there's plenty of, and if you look, read the political science textbooks, there are plenty of lessons how difficult it is to uh, achieve power, to gain power. But there's nothing, there's no textbook uh, discussion on how to, how to give up power. How do you give it up? <laughs> how do you smoothly give it up? What do you do? What, what are the processes? Of doing it, or, or as the, one of the Russian and Polish jokes now, political jokes circulating in Russia and Poland is the, the long. What's the longest way? But what's the longest route? Uh, uh, what's the longest route to capitalism? And the answer is the longest route from capitalism to socialism and back to capitalism again. That's the longest route, <laughs> and which is the route they're they're pursuing at the present time. So we have, in other words, a fantastically exciting situation. We're in. A, we're, in a, we, we're facing a 21st century, which bids bids promise to be the, the century of freedom, in contrast to the 20th century, the century of socialism. Uh, and that means for the domestic front, to get down to the domestic politics, it means that we have a tremendous opportunity for libertarianism. And we, have, we face a situation, just so happens, a coincidental, coincidental with history, we face an American political scene where the, where the, our, the beloved leader, the president, is no longer a charismatic, uh, narcotizing figure in American politics. I mean, we had eight years of Reagan, uh, miserable years for our concern, uh, and uh, eight years of a total blight, where everybody loved Reagan, everybody, with the exception of myself, was crazy about Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> crazy about Reagan. Anything he did was great, and, and he totally he floated above the political scene, sort of showering blessings on everybody, and they all loved it. <laughs> and so it was, not, it was I mean, I mean we're, it's, it's a miracle the Libertarian Party you know, survived through the age of Reagan. It's just a miracle, because everything else... And uh, we shouldn't gripe about the fact we haven't got that many votes anymore. We, how would we survive? That's great. So, so, so now we have George Bush. Who no, nobody loves George Bush, with possible exception of his family. And uh, he's not a charismatic figure. He's not narcotizing anybody. And the whole thing is now erupting. I mean, I think Bush was in power for one week when he had a magnificent uh, talk show host uh, anti-government raise revolution. It was magnificent. It was just great. These bastards want to give themselves a raise. Congress, uh, top government officials, judges, 
They deserve a raise. My goodness, they haven't had a raise in eight years. Terrible thing. You know, we're only getting eight hundred hundred thousand dollars a year now. It should be getting you know, double of that or whatever. So uh, it was going. It was smoothly going through. They didn't have a vote on. They had a phony bipartisan commission set up. One thing, I, by the way, one of my least favorite things in politics are bipartisan commissions. <laughs> Watch out for them. There's always, but both parties are going to pick your pocket and end them. <laughs> so the. Uh, so the bipartisan commission, oh, yes, we need, we need, how can, how can you attract good people in government if you don't give them a big raise? Who wants good people in government? Good people should be in the private sector, helping us out, helping themselves out in the private sector, being productive. We want schmoes in government. We want people, we, we, don't, we want people who can't find the doorknob. <laughs> Why waste productive people as well as, you know, looting the taxpayer? So, we... So, uh, and they, it was all going to go through very smooth. Everybody loved it. Reagan was for it. Bush was for everybody. And the whole establishment, all the, all, the, all the pundits, liberal, conservative, all the rest of it. And suddenly the, the masses erupt. The talk show host movement erupts. You bastard, you're owning yourself a pay raise. How dare you vote yourself a pay raise at our expense? It was a simple, dramatic. And in the early 19th century, by the way, I forget the year, it was some 1830s or something like that, Congress voted itself a pay raise. I mean, it's small, teeny pay raise. My God, we can hardly see it now. And they all kicked out of the next election. It's an uprising, a bipartisan uprising of the public. How dare you guys vote yourself a pay raise at our expense? How dare you? And bingo, they're all out. And this happens. The great thing is, touches the, the interesting thing is the public choice school of economics, a distinguished free market school. I totally can't understand this at all. The public choice school is... The special interests will always win. They've got to win because who cares about one lousy pay raise? It's the only drop of the bucket. If Congress gives itself a 50% pay raise, it's nothing compared to the you know, $2 trillion or whatever it is in the budget. But people, they, 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 people ignore the public choice economists. No, no, how dare you guys vote yourself a pay raise? Uh, and people erupted. It was just great. So that was, um, that. was that. There was also the, another eruption that took place about the same week, I think. Another mass eruption of mass libertarian sentiment uh, against the... Um, Proposed tax, if you remember, the proposed, they didn't call it a tax, of course, because it violated Bush's no tax increase pledge. Uh, it, was a, it was a fee increase <laughs> for, for having a, a bank deposit. Uh, if you have a bank deposit, you, you pay 25 cents on a $100 fee, quote unquote, to the government. That didn't fly either. In fact, that was shot down in four hours. <laughs> it, was magn- it was just magnificent. I mean, I remember it was proposed at 10 in the morning by Secretary of Treasury Brady as a trial balloon floated. How about a fee? <laughs> By two o'clock, I think it was, the crossfire, whatever was on, they said, it's all shot, it's all dead. I mean, both Democrats were conservative, liberal, whatever, dead. Finished? They better, they better not talk about it again if they value their political life. That was it. Four hours, the eruption against the so-called fee increase. And the same thing happened, by the way, even in the Reagan administration, in the proposed tax on, uh, withholding tax on interest and dividends. That was, that was killed by the same sort of public eruption. So now we have... The, liber- the basic libertarian sentiment of much of the public is now free to move again, free to act and, and do stuff because they're removed from the bla- Reagan blight. And, uh, and they're free to express themselves. <clears throat> and also you've got some hot topics here. You've got, for example, 100, it's called a $100 billion bail. Every, every month is a $20 billion increase in the estimated cost of bailing out these rotten SNL banks, okay, which you, of course you have in Texas. Uh, you're on the forefront here in Texas, the cutting edge of bankrupt, <laughs> bankrupt crooked SNLs. Okay? So <laughs> bail them all out. This is now 120 billion. Who knows how many billion? Nobody's against it except libertarians, or I can see. So um, there are lots of issues to talk about, and the fact that, 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 that socialism doesn't work is now shot. Uh, and in, in the midst of all, this, all these tremendous opportunities, domestic and foreign, and the anti cool war, all the rest of it, tremendous opportunities for freedom for the Libertarian Party, what is the National Libertarian Party doing about it? What words are coming, what words, inspirational words are coming from, the, from our beloved leadership in Washington, the National Libertarian Party leadership? What? I mean, is that, was, was there, were, were there any LP signs demonstrating with the Chinese students in New York or Washington? I mean, I'm mean, answering your own question. Of course not. Zip, zilch, nothing, peanuts. Now, when I was on, in the old days, when I was on National Committee, we didn't do a hell of a lot, but at least we had, we passed resolutions, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Doesn't sound like much, but at least something, some attention was paid to what's going on in the world. NACOM met in D.C., was there any, was there any statement of support? China, the Chinese thing was just erupting now. Was there any state, statement of support for the Chinese students for the shouting for freedom and democracy? Was there any, no, there was no statement at all. All they did was knife Matt Monroe and other competent people in the, in the back or in the front. 
back, front and back. <laughs> so NATCOM and that National Party, Libertarian Party leadership at a time of tremendous opportunity, real world opportunities for freedom. Real fantastic things are happening. Or what are they doing? They're playing their own petty rackets and, 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 and vilifying competent people who are trying to get something done and have the party grow. So that's the situation. It's a situation of tremendous opportunity, once again, tremendous real world opportunities for freedom and for libertarianism. And, Almost nothing being done on the concrete level by the party, by the party leadership. Uh, and I think a lot of good state parties. I don't think that, that's the problem. I think the problem is the national leadership. And maybe it's something to be done in Philadelphia about it. I'm always, I'm always hopeful about this. How if, if you can kick out the, the, the Russian leadership and the Polish leadership, if Jaruzelski can suddenly become a liberal from being a, a monster repressor, there's even hope for the LP. There's even hope for an ACON. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>